Good afternoon. This is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece on September 26, 2024. During the past year of genocide in Gaza, Israel's economy has taken a beating. But like all things related to the war on Palestinians, the truth is obscured by Israeli government secrecy and disinformation and the uh, willingness of Western media to obscure the picture of what's actually happening in Israel's economy. And to help us unpack the truth about the economic situation in Israel, I'm pleased to be joined today by Shir Hever. Shir is an independent economic researcher, manager of the Alliance for Justice between Israelis and Palestinians, and coordinator of the military embargo campaign for the Boycott National Committee. His research topics include the Israeli arms trade and security sector, and the economic aspect of the Israeli occupation in the Palestinian territory. He holds a PhD from the Free University of Berlin, and his most recent book is titled The Privatization of Israeli Security. I've known Shir uh, for many years, going all the way back to my earliest days as a board member and correspondent of the Real News Network, uh, but this is the first time that I've had the privilege of interviewing him on this program, Reason to Resist. Uh, thank you for joining us from Germany today, Shir. Thank you for having me, Dimitri, and thanks for this uh, very comprehensive introduction. So, Shir, uh, this week the Israeli media reported that Israel's government uh, is now obliged to resort to austerity. The media didn't call it austerity, but that's what it looks like to me. And specifically, the Times of Israel reported that Israel's finance ministry is planning tax changes, including the freezing and lifting of benefits for pension savings, as it seeks to bring down the large budget deficit uh, and finance the ongoing war in Gaza. The Times of Israel also reported that to offset increased military and civil costs of the war, the government will need to implement what it described as tough spending cuts. Now, I know from my years of covering the financial and austerity crisis in Greece for the real news that increasing taxes and implementing tough spending cuts at the same time is generally a prescription for severe economic contraction. What do you make of the Israeli government's recent announcement regarding its budgetary plans? Does this look like austerity to you? What do you anticipate the impacts of these, bu these budgetary changes will be? Well, about a year and a half ago, when the Israeli government uh, took power, I tried to get some articles into mainstream financial media uh, about uh, this austerity austerity crisis uh, and the contraction of the Israeli economy, which is impending because uh, the government uh, was was acting very recklessly, um, the, the far right government, the most far right in the history of Israel, um, with undermining the, the structures, the state structures, which are in place in neoliberal economies to make sure that the government just doesn't get, get away with whatever they want to do. So. Um, of course, the, the purpose of the Israeli government has not been to um, break the budget and, and go into deficit for the purpose of, of benefiting the standard of living of the public. That has never been on their agenda. The agenda is uh, to expand the borders of Israel to annex land and also to take um, these policies when they know that there's going to be consequences. There's going to, there's going to be international boycotts, divestments and sanctions. Uh, which uh, are exponentially growing as the Israeli government breaks into national law. But this is old news. This is not what, what we're seeing now. Uh, after October 7, after Israel started to engage in genocide, uh, is no longer um, describable with terms such as austerity. W what the Israeli government is failing to do is to live up to its own basic laws uh, regarding, for example, compensating people who have lost property in life um, uh, or, or, or been injured in the course of, of hostilities. Uh, so these uh, very basic things, which, which uh, are the, the groundwork of people having some trust in their state to be able to provide basic services, you know, you, you, you got injured, you want to go to the hospital, you, you need to know that you'll be treated there. Um, but if the... Um, but if you go to the hospital in Israel now, you will see the insurance uh, schemes are not working. The um, lines are long. Doctors have left the country in large numbers. Uh, so people are no longer talking about an economic crisis. They're talking about the state being absent. 
It's a, it's a whole new level. You mentioned this story from the Times of Israel. Uh, let, me, let me try to make this a little bit more precise. The Israeli government, the, the Israeli public is in panic, not because the government is threatening to, to take away some of the um, pension savings and to levy heavy taxes, uh, which, which the Israeli government is not really threatening. That's not what they're saying openly. They're much more panicked about the Ministry of Finance uh, trying to impose rules on the pension funds to force them to invest their money domestically. Because the Israelis are now frantically taking their money out, trying to invest abroad. They have no faith in the future of the Israeli economy. Mm -hmm. So and, and if the government is saying let's let's force them to invest their money locally in order to make sure that there is, um, you know, to to shore up the the stock prices of domestic companies and to make sure that uh, the the currency doesn't uh, get devalued, uh, then people say, oh, we won't have control over our own savings, and the crisis is going to affect us in a way that doesn't give us a way out. In in some ways, what you're describing, not so much the last point, but the government being absent, it almost sounds similar to what Javier Malay is doing in Argentina. Do you see parallels between those two disastrously right-wing economic agendas? I mostly see a, a, a big difference because the, the economic crisis in Argentina, this is not the first economic crisis in Argentina, and you, I'm sure you remember the 2000 uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, there, there are a lot of similarities to what's happening in Israel now in terms of um, people taking out their money, losing faith in the economy, collapse of um, uh, companies that get uh, um, shut down, go bankrupt. But the difference is that in Argentina, whether it was in 2000 or whether it's now, I don't see a lot of people saying, well, this is the end of Argentina. <laughs> you know, the, the, there's not going to be an Argentina next year. Um, this is not the language that I hear from, from Israelis. What I hear from Israelis is a, lang is a, is a qualitative uh, rather than quantitative change. Mm -hmm. There have been crisis, economic crisis in the past in Israel. Never before has there been a level of uh, despair that people don't even believe that reconstruction is possible. And this is, this is the difference. And, and so, the, you know, this kind of pessimism, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, obviously, because as people lose confidence in the economy and stop investing and taking their money out, it accelerates the economic decline. Uh, do you think in, in a capitalist system? Yes. Yes, yes of course. Uh, Israel wasn't always as capitalist and neoliberal as it is today. It used to be, I don't want to say social democracy, because it was only social democracy for the Jews, never for, for the Palestinian indigenous population. Um, but at least for the Jewish population, there have there was a social safety net. There was massive uh, uh, social spend, uh, expenditure to keep up uh, the standard of living, invest in health and education and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so when there was the, the very uh, serious economic crisis of 1966, um, then uh, the government was able to keep things together. And after the war of 67, uh, there was an influx of uh, international investment and uh, the exploitation of Palestinian workers. So Israel emerged from that crisis. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, in the 80s, when when the whole world was undergoing structural adjustment programs uh, and, and neoliberalism took over, Israel also had its structural adjustment program in 1985 and turned the economy into a very, very neoliberal economy, started a massive uh, process of privatization. Now it simply doesn't have the tools to keep the, the economy together as it's falling apart. So as you say, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are no safeguards to, to keep that from happening. Now, you mentioned uh, in the course of answering my question about the Times of Israel article, the impact of sanctions. Um, there have been, I understand, some sanctions imposed by the Turkish government of Erdogan, although apparently what is arguably or could be the most important sanction, cutting off the flow of oil uh, from Azerbaijan. He has not yet taken that step, as I understand it. I also uh, uh, am aware of reports that Colombia is cutting off the flow of coal uh, to Israel and that coal is a very important source of Israeli energy. In your view, what have been the most impactful government, let's put aside for a moment the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and civil society, from a governmental perspective, what do you think have been the most impactful sanctions thus far on Israel's economy? 
Well, this is exactly the combination that you mentioned, Turkey and Colombia, because uh, Israel has uh, natural gas reserves. Some of them are being stolen from the uh, territorial waters of Gaza. But, um, but this natural gas is enough to make Israel self-sufficient in terms of energy for a while. But in order to do that, they need to upgrade their power plants and they need materials, which Turkey is not selling to them because Turkey is saying, rightly so, these are dual use items, steel, concrete um, and, and uh, copper things that, that they need in order to make those power plants. Uh, so that maintains a dependency on coal. And Colombia said, well, as long as the genocide is going on, there's no, we're, we're stopping the coal. Uh, so this combination is a very effective sanction. Mm -hmm. And that's on the government level. I think there, uh, the rest of the governments are, are really um, holding back. And um, we, we see a difference between the global south and the global north. Let's talk a little bit about the global north where uh, the law is very clear. The sanctions are not an option. They are actually an obligation, according to international law, uh, to impose these sanctions, especially when uh, there are things like a jet fuel. So it's not just oil. It's also jet fuel that is used for the warplanes that are bombing and killing civilians. That, that's not a question of, of deciding what's your policy. It's a question about following the rules. Uh, and that's simply illegal. And those um, um, governments are refusing to recognize what international law is. So even governments which have been in the past very friendly with Israel, uh, such as Canada, the UK, and even Germany, they are quietly cutting export permits to Israel uh, because they don't want to get into trouble with international law, but they have so far failed to make a, a statement where they recognize what are their obligations under international law. I want to just point out, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the case of military jet fuel. I recently did a report uh, from the port of Piraeus on two tankers coming from Corpus Christi in the United States carrying military jet fuel to Israel. And uh, the Spanish government uh, and uh, Gibraltar, I understand, did not allow those tankers to dock in their territorial waters, but the government of Greece did. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of Greeks, including this one, who are quite uh, irate about that. Um, could you comment briefly on the nature of the economic relationship between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, which is uh, surprisingly and alarmingly deep and hasn't, it doesn't seem to have been affected materially by uh, the genocide in Gaza? Let me also quickly just comment about these uh, ships, uh, the, such as the Santorini, which are carrying illegally jet fuel to Israel, that they are turning off their uh, satellite transponders. Uh, so, so they know they're doing it illegally, right? They, they're flying uh, dark, so, or uh, sailing dark, so to say, so to speak, uh, as they're um, bringing these fuels, uh, which I think should be a warning sign to the Greek government. If you're uh, allowing these criminal ships uh, to, to uh, dock in your ports, you will carry, um, the, the officials in, in uh, question will carry personal accountability for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, the involvement of Cyprus and Greece uh, is, is very critical geopolitically for, for Israel. And in fact, um, many of the, um, of the steps that led to October 7 and to the genocide have to do with the a European connector because uh, there, there was a US plan to go around Russia and to provide the EU with natural gas from mostly from the Gulf states, so UAE, Qatar, and bringing it with a pipeline through Israel and then to Cyprus and then to Greece and then to the rest of the EU. But in order to do so, they needed a normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And there was a lot of pressure on Saudi Arabia to uh, normalize relations with Israel, despite the ongoing occupation, ethnic cleansing, apartheid situation. Um, and there was some, some concern that Saudi Arabia might, might actually accept that. Uh, and um, I think one of the reasons that Biden has been so fanatically invested in supporting the Israeli military and giving more weapons and more bombs, uh, even in the face of genocide, is because there was this delusion as if Israel might win and then Saudi Arabia will normalize relations with Israel and they can go back and, and create a pipeline 
that would go around um, um, Russia. So that's obviously not happening. But um, but but this maybe explains a little bit the geopolitics of, of the situation. I in within uh, both Greece and Cyprus, public opinion, such as you, what you said about yourself, uh, is very much uh, uh, displeased with governments looking for ways to look looking for loopholes in international law, and most importantly, uh, lo looking for loopholes in humanity. You know, allowing uh, those those deals uh, to be pushed through. Uh, when when people are are dying uh, are being killed are being murdered in unprecedented numbers, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't think this is a sustainable thing. But um, for for the Israeli military industry, it's also very important. Greece and Cyprus play a very important role for the Israeli spyware industry, which we could talk <laughs> very much at length, but maybe. Next time we talk, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Why don't you just give us a little bit of insight into that? I'm curious, uh, briefly, what is the relationship between Greece and Israel when it comes to spyware? Um, so spyware is a technology that uh, is not an Israeli invention, but Israel is the only country in the world which uh, allows private companies to sell it to the highest bidder, because other countries that have this technology guard it very closely. They don't want to falling into the wrong hands. It's a very dangerous technology. It led to the murder, was used to, to assassinate uh, a Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, used to in, um, silence lawyers, human rights workers, politicians, journalists around the world. First, the Israelis tested it on Palestinians, specifically on the six Palestinian civil society organizations, which uh, it tried to outlaw in um, October 2021. And then, um, selling it around the world uh, to the worst regimes possible uh, and to Mitsotakis, uh, who has bought uh, the Intelexa a program called Predator. Uh, Intelexa's headquarters uh -oh. is in Cyprus. Sorry to interrupt. Just so people know they're not familiar with Greek politics, Mitsotakis is the conservative prime minister of Greece. Sorry, go ahead. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so the headquarters of, of this Israeli company Intelexa is based in Cyprus, and they sold it to this, the Greek government, which proceeded to use it against the Greek, um, against their own government, against the opposition, against journalists, in a very, very illegal scandal. Um, and um, this, this is a, a very important uh, aspect of the Israeli military industry, actually. The fact that spyware is not even recognized as a weapon by the United by the EU, and instead the EU is calling it a dual use item, uh, I, I find this absurd because it's used to kill. So returning to the subject of uh, the economy, in the fourth quarter of last year, officially, uh, Israel experienced a contraction of uh, almost twenty percent. I believe the figure was nineteen point four percent. This would roughly coincide the fourth quarter of last year with the first three months of the, uh, the genocidal war in Gaza. Um, do you think that that really captures the full extent of the contraction? But more importantly, what has happened to growth uh, based on the information available to you in 2024? The problem is that we're measuring growth with GDP mostly. And GDP is uh, not a measurement of actual prosperity or standard of living. It's a measurement of economic activity. And when people uh, take their whole, whole family to a hotel because they're afraid to go to, to live in their home uh, and they still pay rent for an apartment they cannot use, that causes an increase in GDP. When people spend their life savings on medical procedures uh, and or, or, or they just take everybody and, and leave the country, these are all things that contribute to the growth of GDP. Uh, the biggest item of growth within the Israeli GDP in terms of consumption, of, of private consumption has been registered in consumption that happened outside of Israel. So Israelis that are spending money, but they're spending it in other countries because they're not in Israel, uh, is, is the most, um, the, the biggest contribution to uh, the, the consumption element of the GDP. And of oh, course, so all of GDP the Israelis were encountering here in the south of Greece and in Cyprus, the money they're spending in these countries is 
is reflected in Israel's GDP. If I got that yes. right. Yes, if, if they are making a purchase using their bank account in Israel, mm -hmm. then it's registered as if uh, the, the it's part of the consumption because uh, pr private consumption, but it's private consumption registered abroad. Okay. And this is what, what they do. I mean, what, what else can they do? Uh, and um, but but GDP is also government consumption. So spending billions of dollars to bring in um, unprecedented amounts of, of ammunition from the United States and weapons. And uh, these are things that um, and, and not just from from the US, of course, uh, from, from anyone who would sell them. The price of one 155 millimeter shell, which is the main weapon of the genocide, killed more Palestinians than any other weapon, started when the war in Ukraine started, the price of one shell was $1,000. It's now at $8,000 per shell. Wow. As a result of the war in Ukraine and as a result of the genocide in Gaza. So they're spending this money and this also contributes to GDP because it's government consumption. So when we talk about growth, it's not a good measurement. In 2006, when Israel invaded Lebanon, a war which was a catastrophe for Israel, I mean, it was a, a, a failure on, on every possible level. Um, it caused an increase in Israel's GDP by 6% because, because of how we measure it, right? But now, despite of all these things, GDP is actually falling on the gross level and on per capita level. Uh, and um, this is, this is uh, just an indication of how deep the actual crisis really is. And, you know, they're saying, but look, unemployment figures are not so high. Well, that's because 85,000 people have left the la labor force and they're not counted as unemployed. They've given up or they left the country. And you have a uh, reservists who are serving in the military for months and months. They've lost their jobs. They're lost contact with their families. Uh, and, uh, and they also don't count as unemployed. You have more than 46,000 businesses that went out of business um because because of this crisis uh, this this is a level of of collapse which but but you know all of these numbers they're they may be interesting but but they're not the real story the real story is as you said before self-fulfilling prophecy when people don't think this is a place where they can raise their children this is not a place where where you would make a long-term investment it's just not not the wise decision. This is what changes uh, the economy more than anything. You know, Shir, I was in uh, Israel and uh, the occupied West Bank in March of this year. And um, because I hadn't seen any reporting on the ground in Elat, I traveled there after spending some time in the West Bank. And uh, what I found was a ghost port. That's how I can describe it. It was absolutely from the commercial maritime activity was non-existent i didn't even see any workers at the main port facility um and the tourist traffic uh was very low very light even though the weather was quite nice um and uh the port as i understand it of elad has effectively declared bankruptcy uh yeah. it's laid off uh much of its staff if not all um I'm curious, uh, I don't know whether this is a bit of a granular question, but has Israel, what, what, what broadly speaking have been the economic impacts of the attacks on the shipping in the Red Sea by Ansar Allah? And do you believe that Israel has been able to compensate for this by increasing activity at its other ports, for example, Haifa or Ashdod? What is your take on all of that? Well, first of all, the port of Elat has never been a very important port for Israel. The fact that it uh, declared bankruptcy, that's not really the main story because the big ships bringing cargo from East Asia and so on, they, they go through the Suez Canal and then they use the ports of Ashdod or Haifa anyway, right? So Elat um, is, is not well connected to the rest of Israel to begin with, uh, which, which uh, ma makes more sense for the ships to, to unload their cargo than in different ports. Um, nevertheless, Elat is important because uh, of the, the threat that the, the Mediterranean ports will not be able to function in case of, of uh, um, an escalation of, of the war uh, in Lebanon, then this would um, force Israel to use Elat as their only port that access international waters, uh, and now they can't. So that's, that's an important uh, um, thing to remember. But 
Um, when we talk about compensate, compensating, I think the most interesting and important aspect here is the supply chain for the weapons. This is also what I'm following most uh, uh, very closely because the um, the weapons that Israel is trying to to import when when international law says that simply illegal depend on bringing in dual use items from India, from Vietnam, um, and, and other distant ports where there are companies that are willing to, to sell this, but they're trying to keep it secret. And nevertheless, um, the information leaks because there are people within the, the shipping companies that, that cannot stay silent. They know exactly what these explosives are going to be used for. And these ships have no choice but to go around Africa. And once they go around Africa, they have to sail to Israel. Uh, and they make all of these contracts along the way, because from a shipping point of view, it doesn't make sense to take just, you know, eight containers of, of explosives uh, just to Israel, and that doesn't pay for the whole journey. So what you do is you take containers uh, to sell them along the path in different ports, on your way to Israel, and you make contracts with all these ports along the way. And, and this is how you, you make these business ventures profitable. But these ships are discovering that if the information comes out that they are carrying weapons to Israel illegally, they're going to meet with protests in each and every port. And not just port, you've mentioned Spain and Portugal, uh, sorry, Spain and, and Gibraltar. Gibraltar, uh, we don't have an official statement by them because it's the UK. Uh, they just uh, expressed displeasure, but they didn't actually issue an official government decision not to allow the ships to dock, but um, Namibia did. And this is very important because Namibia has also allowed us to publish their letter in which they say, you're carrying weapons that would be, or dual use items, explosives, that would be um, used to, uh, to sell to Israel. This is illegal. You cannot dock here. Uh, so the ships, the, you know, they have enough fuel, they have enough food and water for the crew to just go straight to Israel. They can do this, but then they've lost all of their contracts along the way, and they're going to lose a lot of money. And so this is a very effective thing that by blocking the uh, Suez Canal and, and by raising international awareness to what's happening, uh, the, the ability of Israel to import weapons illegally has has been uh, severely uh, undermined. Of the the Red Sea uh, blockade is much more in fact impactful on on international trade than on the Israeli trade. That's something if if we're talking not about the weapons but gen generally about money. Mm -hmm. The two biggest uh, freight companies in uh, Europe are uh, Maersk and Hapagloid, a, a Danish company and a German company, and both of these companies. Uh, decided that they cannot uh, make a decision to skip their stops in Israel, so they cannot go through the Red Sea, because if they would, they would uh, be called anti-Semites. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, two giant Chinese freight companies are just saying, well, we're just going to make a business decision. We're not going to stop in Israel. They can sail very safely through the Red Sea. That's not a problem. Um, and the response of the German government and the Danish government for their corporations losing billions of euros is to send warships to the Red Sea and fight a war trying to open the Red Sea for their trade. So we're going back to colonial uh, naval wars uh, of the 19th century uh, just, just because Germany and Denmark are not willing to uh, work to achieve a ceasefire. Do you think that this uh, the impacts on companies like Maersk and shipping uh, from Europe and to Europe uh, is contributing materially to the economic difficulties that Germany is currently sustaining? The the economic difficulties that Germany is sustaining are are very um, deep in in in, a, in the sense that Germany has a, a government that was elected to promote soft power, diplomacy, environmental responsibility, and they took and they pivoted 180 degrees and, and they became a war government. So I don't think we we are supposed to to take this conversation into German politics. I just happen to live here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yes, but, but yeah, I was I was I was uh, concerned you might say 
you know, as Annalena Burbeck did, 360 degrees, but uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. let's stay on the subject of, uh, of Israel, shall we? I, actually, I want to talk more broadly about the situation in West Asia, and this is, I think, a, a pivotally important question, which isn't discussed often enough as we're watching this war escalate out of control. Um, in the West, we don't talk about the potential economic impacts on the global economy, not just the economy of Israel, not just the economy of the countries directly involved in the combat, but the global economy of a full-blown war in West Asia. And by that, I mean a war that involves uh, Iran using the means at its disposal, for example, to shut the Strait of Hormuz, uh, to increase the pressure on Red Sea shipping, uh, uh, direct attacks by Israel, the United States on Iran, Iran reciprocating, and Hezbollah bringing to bear you know, the full force of its missile arsenal and its combat capability in that kind of a war. Uh, and if it goes on for months, what would you anticipate? I, I appreciate this is a very difficult question here. A lot of variables, a lot of unpredictability and so forth. And we're talking about a complex global economy. What broadly speaking, would you anticipate the impacts on the global economy to be in that situation? Well, I think we're, we're seeing already a process of, of decline of US hegemony. If you remember the uh, war in Vietnam, the US was willing to um, spend so much money, so much blood, so much uh, energy and, and effort to keep South Vietnam uh, as, as its proxy state and, and to keep it alive. Um, and a lot of people believe that the US will, will do even more for Israel, but I don't see it this way. I don't think that all of this talk, all of this propaganda about the pro-Zionist propaganda in the United States and, and talking about uh, its uh, commitment to, to stand with Israel, are they willing to, to see thousands of, of US soldiers dying for this? I don't think so. Uh, and th there's a certainly, and, and certainly if you listen to the rhetoric of Trump, which is very America first, right? Uh, it, it doesn't care about, um, about supporting Israel when it costs something. This is why I think that um, it's also part of the calculation of these actors that you mentioned, Iran, Hezbollah, and so on. They know that the, the strategic support that Israel can count on from the United States is limited, and it's also limited in terms of time ahead of the US elections. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned that Hezbollah is not using all of its force to bear. I, I'm seeing Israeli um, generals, Israeli analysts saying clearly Hezbollah is um, trying to, to play for time and they're not escalating the, the fighting. They're, they're doing the minimum just, you know, to, um, to, to uh, maintain their reliability or their, their credibility as, a, as a, an organization, as, as a fighting uh, a unit. But, um, but, this, but, but meanwhile, you see in the Israeli media, these articles, these comments where they say, look, Hezbollah is, is defeated, Hezbollah is on their knees by injuring uh, 1,500 of their uh, fighters that cannot fight anymore, uh, they, don't have, uh, they cannot resist anymore, uh, they're running out of missiles. And these are arrogant statements that are so blatantly, so, so clearly false that really, um, I, I'm very worried about this because, because then uh, it, it justifies within the Israeli discourse escalating more and more um, the a violence which, which is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it only means that thousands will, will die in Lebanon, thousands will die in Israel. Uh, it's, it's a cycle of, of uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I, I don't want to say cycle of violence because it's not. It, it starts from Israel, so it's a one-sided uh, cascade of violence coming from from the Israeli side. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, Israel is is driving off a cliff. Yeah. But in terms of the uh, economic impact, I would have thought that one of the primary impacts of a war of that magnitude, particularly one that is sustained over a period of months or horror of horrors years, uh, uh, is that uh, the price of oil is going to soar. And uh, that uh, Europe would be particularly hard hit by this uh, because of its dependence on uh, oil and gas from the region. 
uh, and also the fact that it's already teetering economically uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, do you agree with that assessment that that's likely to be a major impact of the war uh, of that nature? But you're describing things that already happened. You're describing how the war in Iraq, for example, impacted uh, global politics uh, and, uh, and, and the global economy. Um, but now I think we're seeing something a bit different. In May of uh, last year, there was this historic peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Israeli government, uh, sorry, not, not last year. Uh, uh, yeah, so, sorry, uh, 2023, May, uh, yeah. uh, it was, it has taken the Israelis completely by surprise, and also the Americans. The CIA had no clue this is going to happen. The Israeli Mossad had no clue this is going to happen. Um, China mediated this peace agreement. Mm -hmm. It's a change in the geopolitical balance. And so it's not a question of what will happen to the price of oil. It's a question of who will set the price of oil and who will have the ability to tell, to, to dictate trade terms to the EU and to the United States when it comes to um, the Middle East, West Asia, uh, uh, this whole region. And how is this going to affect uh, the so-called moderate regimes in the Middle East, which in other words, the pro-US <laughs> governments in the US, how are they going to, to be able to maintain power when the biggest actor in the region is no longer the US. Uh, I think the EU is, is in a state of um, political vacuum. They're so paralyzed when, when you have different voices coming from, from different EU um, uh, states and, and they need unity and they need uh, for, 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 to take any meaningful decision and they end up with, with a useless um, um, uh, leadership. Uh, which which is doing nothing, then so far their idea was, okay, well, the EU is paralyzed, but we just follow the US and the US will tell us what to do. Uh, but um, this is this is not a very good idea if, if the power admire, situation it, changes completely. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So, Shira, this has been, you know, we, we definitely have to continue this conversation. It's been fascinating and enlightening, uh, but I, I have another interview to do and I would very much like to continue it. And I hope... Uh, you know, in the month of October, we can resume the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And this is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece, along with Shir Hever from Germany.